Um, again, welcome to the Free Library. Uh, my name is Jason. I work here in Author Events, and I am very excited to be here tonight to introduce the editors of N Plus One Magazine. N Plus One is an online and print magazine that publishes social criticism, political commentary, literature, reviews, and books that expand on the interests contained therein. By opting for what the New York Times calls, quote, the possibility of seriousness against the glibness and superficiality of the age, end quote. N Plus One's new essay collection, City by City, peels back stereotype, pretense, and PR for a raw and revelatory yet still often celebratory, look at some of America's best and least known, uh, least known and understood urban areas. And these are written by the people who live in them. Uh, from Fresno and Phoenix to Boise and Baltimore, this anthology examines the socioeconomic, political, and corporate forces that have shaped, shattered, and refashioned the American city. It's critical theory meets Cleveland. Here to tell you more are City by City Editor Stephen Squibb, N Plus One Editor Dana Tor Torichi, Contributor Elias Rodriguez, and Ariella Cohen from Next City, and they will discuss the landscape of Los Angeles, the, aggress the aggressive policing of Florida youth, and the future of our own Philly. Here to tell you more, ladies and gentlemen, won't you please join me in welcoming the fine folks from N Plus One Magazine. Hi, can you guys hear me? Great, so I'm Ariella Cohen. I'm not from M Plus One. Um, I'm right here in Philadelphia from Next City. We're an online magazine about cities. We focus on urban policy, um, looking at um, the people making, driving change in, in cities around the world. Uh, we're based here in Philly, but in fact, we do cover everywhere from Medellin to San Francisco, to this week's feature about the city of Cleveland. So I'm really excited to see you all here tonight to join us um, for this talk. And we're gonna start with readings from two of these fantastic writers. And why don't we start with you, Dania? Okay, great. Hi, my name is Dana Tortorici. Um, I'm the co-editor in chief of N Plus One Magazine. N Plus One is a journal of literature, culture, and politics. It comes out three times a year. And we're also a small publisher that puts out books, expanding on the interests of the magazine, and City by City, edited by Stephen Squibb, to my right, and Keith Gesson, who is not here tonight, is our latest book. It just came out in May, and we're very excited about it. Um, I'm going to read from an essay I wrote about Los Angeles, which is where I'm from. And the title is called Los Angeles Plays Itself, which is a reference to a really excellent documentary by a documentarian named Tom Anderson. Has anybody seen this movie? I hope <laughs> Shannon has. Um, it's on Netflix now. It, for years it was really, really difficult to get your hands on because it, as I'll talk about in the essay, um, it's a video essay stitched together, uh, or of, it's a video essay that has elements of different films set in Los Angeles stitched together into a sort of narrative about the character that Los Angeles is in the history of American cinema because whenever you needed to make a film and have a city in the background, whether it was supposed to be Chicago or Shanghai or New York or wherever, they would just stick LA in it because it was the city that was nearby. And so despite being the most oft-captured city on film, it has very few recognizable monuments because it needs to be every possible city. Um, so growing up in the city was very strange because it was the city that was omnipresent in media and yet totally unknowable because it didn't have any sort of, it, you know, it didn't have a New York public library. It didn't have like a major art museum that was like, oh, there's our monument, except for the Hollywood sign, which is actually just a sign for real estate. It was never meant to be a beautiful monument for anything. Um, so anyway, it's a great film. I recommend it. In the meantime, here is a little excerpt from the piece. Teenagers. To be in LA without a car is to be at the mercy of whoever will give you a ride. In this way, it both is and isn't a teenager's town. Nobody knows where to go. It's not a city designed for accidental social discoveries. You think of a place, you look it up, you go. 
You look up the way back, you go home. I was always terrified to go too far. My little brother had his adolescence after Google Maps, so he went everywhere with a sense of ease and entitlement that I found both repulsive and enviable. He could never get lost. I wasn't brave, but neither is he, and I at least had to ask leering guys in academic Spanish how to get back to the 10. I asked my brother what he did with his freedom. Valley parties, he said. All I ever did was drive the familiar loop of surface streets I knew, smoking cigarettes, blasting the heat with the windows down on winter nights. I drove from the Starbucks to the coffee bean where Perez Hilton wrote a celebrity gossip blog, to the other Starbucks and the other coffee bean, where the girls in my class smoked parliaments with homeless Vietnam vets as part of their method acting research for the school play. We ate frozen yogurt for lunch and also for dinner and smoked and drove until we had to go home. The other thing we did was drive up steep streets to look at the city from above, to the top of the Hollywood Hills, to the top of Santa Monica Mountains, to Mulholland, to the Westridge Fire Road up the street from where Kobe Bryant's dad supposedly lived in the house that Kobe bought for him. There were rumors that the ceilings and appliances were built extra tall to accommodate him. From the fire road, you could see the whole city from, Pacific, from the Pacific Ocean all the way past downtown and on a clear day to San Bernardino and Catalina Island. I mostly remember growing up as a series of establishing shots like this one. There's not a lot of romance in ripping up Joshua trees and pumping water where it doesn't belong, but the result does look majestic at night, dense with lights as clear as the sky must have been before light pollution. This view is our compensation for smog, for never getting to see any real stars. Meanwhile, the smog, like the airborne toxic event in white noise, creates vulgar, beautiful, sorbet sunsets. It was reported that the city's most devastating wildfire in 2007 was caused by a combination of drought, snapped power lines threaded through Malibu, a rogue pyromaniac, and a 10-year-old boy left alone with a box of matches. Before this was consensus, I was told that some teenagers hotboxing a cave in Malibu left a joint burning. It caught a straw of dry brush and, lit, and in, in days lit half the coast on fire. Weed. The weed here is not for lightweights. I can't smoke it at all. The last time I tried, I drooled uncontrollably and couldn't stop touching my hair. Our brothers had cannabis club cards for migraines and our parents had them for cancer, which meant that legal access to marijuana, even when I was a teenager, was easy. Dispensary offerings have the stupidest names. Blue Dream, Berry White, Chocolope, Shark Shock, Sour Diesel Reserve, Super Lemon Haze, Green Crack, Cadillac Purple, OG Kush, Be Real, LA, LA Confidential, Diablo OG, Girl Scout Cookies, Jedi, Skywalker, Yoda. On this dumb name stuff, you can high just get, get high just being in the room. But you better have a club card. The LA County jail system is the largest in the world. 88 municipalities, 74 law enforcement agencies, 30-some criminal courthouses, and eight jail facilities. It houses an estimated 20,000 people a year. Between 2004 and 2008, nearly 40% of arrests were for drug-related felonies or misdemeanors. Of those arrested for marijuana possession, only 23% were white, according to the FBI. But the FBI undermines its own data lumping Latinos with whites where the LAPD doesn't. So it's even fewer white people than that. Latino is an ethnic as opposed to a racial category, a distinction honored more in statistics than in everyday policing. Although blacks make up a little less than 10% of LA County's population, they constitute 30% of marijuana arrests. Speech. Actors and immigrants come here to have their speech scrubbed of regional inflection. Signs stapled to the power line poles say vocal coach and speak English perfectly and get rid of your accent and list a phone number. People like to say that everyone in Los Angeles is an RV or an immigrant, but that's no more true of LA than it is of any other big city. What is true is that the city does not aggressively remind you of its history. I think vocal fry was invented here. That kind of sour, elongated, throaty way of talking that makes a long A sound slide into a long I sound, swaps, swaps a for a, and nearly drops the long E altogether, as in which way to the beach? And your haircut looks really good. Where'd you get it? 
Frank Zappa's 1982 song, Valley Girl, put LA's speech on the map when his 14-year-old daughter, Moon, sang, spoke the lyrics like, oh my God, like totally. This was notable. In LA, people are supposed to sound like they're from nowhere in order to sound like they're from anywhere, a central casting accent. The new vocal fry is like the valley girl, sapped of enthusiasm, poolside on clonopin, constrained to the lowest register. Los Angeles plays itself. The landscape, too, has this ability to self-erase its particularities and become mutable. For decades, it has been forced to play other cities in the movies. In his incredible 2003 documentary, Los Angeles Plays Itself, the filmmaker Tom Anderson chronicles every city Los Angeles has, been play has played in the history of American cinema. A video essay splicing together scenes from other films, famous and obscure, the movie draws out the city's architecture as a character. Again and again, it has played a city with no name, the voiceover says. Shots of nondescript nighttime scenes in front of hotels and movie theater marquees loop again and again. Its landmarks are obscure enough that they can play multiple roles. In 1942, the Bradbury Building downtown played a Mandalay Hotel in China Girl. In 1944, it played a London military hospital in the White Cliffs of Dover. It was the office of a New York publisher in Wolf in 1994. It played the future, most famously, in the climactic rooftop scene in Blade Runner in 1982. Frank Lloyd Wright's Mayan revival Ennis House in Los Feliz, built in 1924, quote, Transcend, transcends space and time. Anderson cites seven films in as many seconds. The Ennis House, quote, could be fictionally lo located in Washington in Time Soccer's 1987, or Osaka, Black Rain, 1989. It could play an ancient villa, Howling to Your Sister is a Werewolf, 1985, a 19th century haunted house, House on Haunted Hill, 58, a contemporary mansion, the Terminal Man, 74, a 21st century apartment building, Blade Runner again, or a 26th century science lab in which Klaus Kinski invents time travel. It's not that the buildings are indistinct. They un look unlike anything else, which makes it even weirder that they're swapped in like it's no big deal. No one would ever let the New York Public Library play a building in another city this way. That's what's What's made them interchangeable is the cultural dominance of Hollywood. Hollywood has denied Los Angeles the ability to be particular. We have monuments, but nobody knows what they are except for the Hollywood sign. What says Los Angeles more than the Hollywood sign? Or rather, does anything say Los Angeles but the Hollywood sign? It's the only distinguishing symbol you'll see on souvenir keychains at LAX. You could get the one with palm trees, but then you may as well be in Florida or Hawaii. Anderson observes that in movies, villains often live in high modernist international style apartments with living rooms encased in glass and cantilevered over a wide valley. The glass is an invitation for ejection. Someone unfortunate will fly through it, grip the ledge of the building with a bloodied hand, and to the sound of screeching strings fall into the obscure mountain brush, never to be seen again, at least until the sequel. Some of these houses for villains still stand. Richard Neutra's Lovell Health House in Los Feliz, made for a naturopath in the 1920s and reconceived as the home of a pimp in LA Confidential, is a favorite for architecture tourists. Many of the fakes, the prefab reproductions perched on the bluffs overlooking PCH, detached and slid down the cliffs during the 1994 earthquake. Some have been rebuilt. Air Schmidt. Whenever, one, whenever anyone condemns the cultural vacuity of Los Angeles, Defenders bring up the famous German emigres who moved there during the war. Adorno, Horkheimer, Mann, Brecht, Neutra, Lang, Schoenberg. In The Rest is Noise, the, critic, the music critic Alice Ross describes a scene between Schoenberg and the wife of the novelist Leon Feuchtwanger at the Brentwood Country Mart, a grocery store with an outdoor fire pit where my parents used to take my sister and me to get fried chicken. Marta Fjordwander, sorry, I can't say that name, is handing some grapefruit when she sees the composer, wild-eyed, coming at her. Lies, Frau Marta, lies, he screams. You have to know, I've never had syphilis. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, the story. I've since upgraded to an upscale shabby chic boutique complex where the general store sells bubble mailers and Lacoste polo shirts. The Country Mart is now home to go the Goop pop-up store, a physical reality version of Gwyneth Paltrow's lifestyle website. 
Bertolt Brecht, who is famously miserable here, oops, did this go out? No, it's okay. Bertolt Brecht, who is famously miserable here, wrote a poem about LA called Contemplating Hell, after Shelley's Hell is a City Much Like London. Hell, wrote Brecht, must be even more like Los Angeles. Here's some of the poem. In hell, too, there are, I cannot doubt, these luxuriant gardens with flowers as big as trees, which, to be sure, wilt without delay, if not watered, with very expensive water, and fruit markets with huge piles of fruit, which nonetheless have ne neither scent nor taste, and endless trains of cars, lighter than their own shadows, faster than foolish thoughts. I don't know. Can you hear me still? I'll say it again, after the very expensive water. <laughs> Excuse me. And endless trains of cars, lighter than their own shadows, faster than foolish thoughts, gleaming vehicles in which pinkish people, coming from nowhere, drive nowhere, and houses built for the fortunate, which therefore stand empty, even when inhabited. The houses in hell are not all ugly, either. But the worry of being thrown into the street consumes the residents of the mansions, no less than those who dwell in the slums. He was wrong about the produce, but right about everything else. There were other Germans. Three miles or so from Breck's house on 26th Street, tucked into the Santa Monica Mountains, stands Murphy Ranch, a 55-acre compound built in 1933 by a small group of Nazi sympathizers. According to the sketchy historical record, they were also mystical cultists under the sway of a charismatic German, Er Schmidt, who claimed to have supernatural powers. The ranch was enormously extensive. There were plans for a mansion, a timed irrigation system for sustainable agriculture, a water tank, and a power station. Hikers in Will Rogers State Park still stumble, across the, still stumble upon the concrete infrastructure of their aborted fascist utopia. Now, though covered in graffiti, it's a nice place to walk your dog. Thank you. A round of applause. Now Elias Rodriguez is going to read um, his piece, which I will allow him to introduce for us. I'm Elias. I am. I live in Philly, but I grew up in Palm Coast, Florida, which is roughly in the middle of nowhere. It was once the fastest growing town in the U.S., bizarrely enough. The urban legend is that there were these Eric Estrada advertisements in the 80s that older woman who really loved chips and men who wanted to be just like Eric Estrada on chips sort of really identified with and decided they had to buy a house in Palm Coast, in which case they would then become Eric Estrada, which happened to nobody, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> it was a weird place in that it was unexpectedly violent. I'm getting into my piece. I also, I guess you could call me a contributor to N plus one. I think of myself as the person who is fun at the parties and knows all the gossip. Um, and I'm about to be a graduate student. And this is my essay, Fear and Aggression in Palm Coast. Most of the unsubstantiated stories I heard in high school focused on violence. The time someone pulled a knife on BD at the eighth grade dance and how his boys jumped him afterward. The time someone pulled a knife on Jackson in the hallway and how, grabbing the knife holding hand in one fist, Jackson punched with the other until blood splattered the ceiling. The time some kids jumped some other kid with a spiked bat outside the library. Were these stories true? I don't know, but the possibility that they were lurked beneath every argument, encouraging us to consider hurting one another in advance. Few of us were native to Palm Coast, Florida. Most of the 75,000 people suspended in that suburban stretch alongside the Atlantic between Jacksonville and Orlando came from elsewhere. When I arrived from New York, the ambient climate of violence surprised me. The local teenage boys, ever the putative aggressors, seemed normal. We played sports, worked restaurants part-time, shamed any outbreak of feminine behavior, and chased girls. When it was warm, we surfed. Still, the town had a fierce atmosphere. In 2005, the year I started high school there, Florida passed a law repealing a defender's duty to retreat. Stand your ground sanctified deadly force in any situation where a person felt threatened, even beyond the boundaries of his or her, or her home or property. 
My mother worried about this law as she had about its predecessor, the Castle Doctrine. Many people feel threatened by black males, she warned me, even skinny, studious ones like me. I could lose my life for stepping on the wrong lawn. My response was a fear that has never left. I remember the first time I wore my extra, extra large black hoodie in fall of freshman year. Walking to the bus, I imagined my white neighbors peering through their blinds into the early morning dark. What would they see when they saw me? If they saw a thief, then they would call the cops. Bad as that might be, it would be worse if they decided to handle things themselves. I took my sweatshirt off and braved the cold. Later, a white friend confessed that my hoodie scared him, and that was why he had not spoken to me on the bus. I must have looked ridiculous, a boy swimming in cotton, but fear has a way of making dark skin appear older than it is. I hated that walk to the bus. For a while, I tried carpooling with a friend, but he dropped out of school. My mom bought a used Dodge and drove me until gas prices spiked, and I went back to my morning walk. Unable to afford a jacket, I wore my hoodie again when frost settled on my neighbor's lawns. As we got older, the paranoia sown by Stand Your Ground became a permanent fantasy of provocation. Like its predecessor, the, Cad the Castle Doctrine, it made it rational to err on the side of aggression. For my black friends, hostility was ever present, and so we endlessly prepared for battle. As teenagers, we bragged about our strength, about how nobody could hurt us, how we would win any fight. Even when we didn't believe ourselves, we sometimes fooled each other. The fear was worst at night, and especially when I walked the half mile home from my friend Jerome's. Once, two white policemen stopped me. After they stepped out of the car, I don't know if I imagined it, I refused to look. One of them had his hand poised by the gun on his waist. What are you doing around here? He asked, going home. This late at night? It was 10 p.m. on a Saturday. Yes, sir. Do you live around here? I remembered the time some cops stopped a black friend on his way home, shoved his face to the ground, and handcuffed him. Maybe tonight was my night. I had been handcuffed without reason before. In Los Angeles in the 1980s, the police beat a cousin of mine who was running to catch his school, bu school bus. I said, I live around the block. I've never seen you around here, said the hand by the holster, and I live just down the street. How long have you lived here? It didn't seem as if they were going to let me off without a few bruises. I considered running, but didn't want, <clears throat> but didn't want to be shot in the back. I said, I've lived here about three years, but I don't go outside very often. Where are you coming from? A friend's house. The holster stepped forward and said, are you lying to us? No, sir. This went on for 20 minutes as they waited for me to contradict myself. It never occurred to me that this law enforcement was my law enforcement, paid for by my taxes, charged with protecting me from criminals. These were not my police. Eventually, they let me go. As they stepped into the car, the one with his hand by his holster said, you shouldn't be out this late at night anymore. That night, I listened to Tupac's thug's mansion in my bedroom. I recalled that scene from Boys in the Hood where the crooked cops stopped Trey, the protagonist, and one puts a gun to his neck for no reason. When Trey arrives at his girlfriend's house, he says, I'm tired of this shit. I'll kill all these motherfuckers. Then he sobs and swings at nothing, repeating, I'm sick and fucking tired of this shit. I'm sick of this shit. After wearing himself out, he sits down, holding his girlfriend and crying. I had not cried in years. I never felt comfortable punching at people or at shadows, and I had nobody to sob with. Callous and cold, I lay in bed, contemplating what would happen if I stayed in the South. So we're going to stop the readings right now. Um, let's give a round of applause for Elias. time constraints. This is a union shop. We've got to be out of here at 8.30. So we're going to kind of go through some quest questions. But think of your own questions because I definitely want to hear from the audience. First, I'm going to ask Stephen. Um, Stephen's the editor of this wonderful anthology. Um, so I just am curious about sort of 
the themes that you saw emerge um, over the several years of compiling the pieces in here and sort of where you felt like the direction of thought around American cities went in that period? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think one of the things, the, one of the first things that leapt out to uh, both me and Keith when we were editing this is that uh, people have a tendency to write about different cities in the same way. Uh, which was really well, not something we expected. So the first, I would say maybe half of the first six essays, we, or maybe nine essays we got were like, City X is the city of dreams. Those <laughs> dreams met reality, but the city triumphed anyway. And like regardless of whether this was like in the deep south or in like the Pacific Northwest, every city was the city of dreams. And so like we had to actually sort of work through like all of these ways that people are actually just sort of narrating their own experience of like, having dreams and like meeting reality and then triumphing anyway and then projecting <laughs> that onto whatever city they were writing about. Um, and that was really fascinating to see how deep those sort of like personal psychological structures are and how they're just read in terms of any number of cities. Um, once we got through that, um, a number of themes emerged. Um, certainly the one that, that kept coming back again and again is the history of white flight. Um, leaving the uh, inner core of different cities and moving to the suburbs, and then the, uh, the devastation of the tax base leading to uh, a completely transformed uh, urban fabric, which is then sort of reoccupied by the sons and daughters of the folks who left in the first place. Um, and how that has been negotiated or not by different cities was really, really consistent. Um, certainly, we started this project in the, in the sort of wake of the financial crisis, and so, um, hearing about how that has impacted different uh, cities was something that, that showed up a lot. Yeah, and one theme that I saw really emerge is just that kind of insider-outsider dynamic. Um, Elias, in your story, it, it played out on the sense of like, I never thought of the police as my police. I never considered it that my tax dollars were going to these to the police. And Dana, I feel like it played out in many ways throughout your essay, um, and also in your essay, Elias, just the general sense of sort of alienation and racism. <laughs> but but in, in your piece, I felt it pay, played out in a variety of ways, the multiple layers of sort of insider, outsider, knowingness of LA and sort of this elusive, can anyone really know the city that is this kind of mirage of itself? And so I wonder if urban identity is this just kind of ever mutating reflection, projection, and how you saw, it seemed like you had pretty youthful writers reflecting their own futures back into those cities. Sorry, wait, would you, would you repeat the question? So <laughs> we're all always projecting onto cities. There's yes. a lot of insider-outsider dynamics. Stephen just spoke about how a lot of the writers were sort of writing to this place of they did not grow up in a city, they're returning to the city. And so I was curious about sort of themes of future city. What, how were people imagining their own futures playing out in cities or the future sort of identity of place? Yeah, um, I have, a, you know, after I published this essay, um, I got a lot of blowback from people who live in Los Angeles who either grew up there in a different part of the city, which is, you know, an enormous, enormous city, um, you know, the old saw about LA being like, what, seven suburbs in search of a city, like this is not a new problem to LA. Um, but you know, people who are either from a different part of LA that I, that I was or people who had since moved there since I, since I left uh, when I was 18. And I, there's a piece, part of the essay where I talk about downtown um, and downtown LA and how downtown LA, because it's um, sort of circumscribed by this series of enormous highways um, and because of the, the office buildings in there and how unfriendly it is to pedestrians, like doesn't really feel like an occupied part of town. And a lot of people were like, you know, what about like the newly revived like historic arts district or like I, you know, people who like whose Twitter handles were like self-described like gelato eater and like, you know, <laughs> you know, ambulist, and I was just like, and they were really mad and panned me for not knowing about what the cool new thing was downtown, and I was just like, who, I, this is how my people must, who grew up in Brooklyn must feel about me, though I'm not like, how dare you not talk about my Brooklyn? So I think that I, I'm attuned to this in a different way, because LA in, in particular is a strange city, um, but it is very weird to see like, 
the gentrification of your own city, even if you are not part of a displaced population. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting things about this, you know, this book coming out is we've done events in different cities and you talk about like the same pattern, psychological pattern repeating itself in different essays. Um, the gentrified, like gentrified parts of town look the same everywhere. Um, I was just in San Francisco in a coffee shop that looked exactly like a coffee shop in LA, that looked exactly like a coffee shop in um, New York. The only discernible difference to me was that the person behind the laptop was coding. I'd never seen anybody work on code, <laughs> freelance in a coffee shop. In LA, it's like a screenplay, and in New York, they're just looking at Facebook or whatever. Um, uh, but, but point being, um, yeah, it's difficult to write about cities. People feel very proprietary, or you know, people feel very possessive of where they're from, and it's it's a very delicate thing to represent something um, that belongs to many people that you can never really know. Especially because cities, as they have been, you know, composed traditionally, are you know very disparate in terms of like population and demographic. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say about this is that I think that in terms of people who come from cities and are going back to cities and looking at them or repopulating cities, um, when you know something, when you know a place, you don't know it the way a tourist does. And so when writing about LA, I felt like I needed to even like revisit cliche, tourist cliches about the city in order to have a bird's eye view of it because all of the cliches are true. And part of what's interesting about writing from that kind of view is being like, yeah, no, the traffic is that bad. It's really bad there, you know? Um, and so trying to find that, finding that balance of representing the sort of broad stroke cliches of every city that are true of every city and then also the granular weirdness of occupying any place is, you know, I think part of the insider-outsider dynamic that is just, you know, inherent in being a person who lives in a city. And Stephen, could you kind of talk a little bit about that? Did you see any sort of unified vision or any vision at all for a future reading all these essays? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I think um, uh, in particular the, the excerpt that you were going to run on, on Next City uh, about Cleveland uh, and how they have really found a way of reorganizing some of the sort of um, inner city uh, institutions and, and businesses to cooperate to create sort of local sustainable economies. I, I think, yeah, there's definitely a lot of ideas there. Um, and I think in general that this is a, a group of writers and, and perhaps a generation that is committed to living in the city um, for the duration. And so whatever, uh, so there will be a future uh, to the city. I think the thing that, it, the, the difference that ultimately became most striking to me, I think, over it was the difference between cities that are gentrifying um, where actual real estate now stands in for other kinds of assets um, because there's nothing that can give you the kind of yield on investment like real estate in certain parts of cities and the cities that are having the opposite problem um, of either shrinking or um, sort of losing their, their social basis so rapidly and, and how oddly um, the, the possibilities for transformation are in some sense much greater in the cities that are not gentrifying. Uh, in the cities that are gentrifying, we pretty much know what's going to happen. It's all going to look like Manhattan, uh, which is a series of, of chain stores like, you know, Target uh, and Trader Joe's. It's basically going to look like the suburbs where we came from. Um, and maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but that's, there's not a whole lot of mystery there. Well, what I think will be more interesting is to see cities like Cleveland and Detroit uh, that have been sort of, uh, you know, at the lowest that they're going to be and are now coming back and, 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 and seeing what that looks like, if it does end up in the same place eventually or if it's something really different. And I have one question for you, Elias, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Your essay was really powerful, really provocative, I thought. And um, I just I wanted to know your feeling about going back. Yeah, this is something I think about a lot. Uh, thanks for the praise, first off. Um, I haven't been back to Palm Coast maybe since 2010. I often have this desire to go home. The beach is great. Some of my friends are there. And it's scary, I think. I, there's a way that I have become accustomed to living in non-southern states above the Mason-Dixon line and not worrying about the sorts of things that I might encounter there 
the most basic of which is, you know, in my high school hallways, it was not uncommon to hear someone use the N-word with a hard R derogatorily, applied to me, applied to other people. And there's a certain strength in saying that, that, that the person is harnessing. You know, it's like they're aware that no one is going to beat them for it because there are enough people, there's enough sort of support and supremacy there that they don't have to worry about using this word that's incendiary elsewhere. So though I really want to go back, I think, in part because there are people who I'm not necessarily friends with anymore, there are people that I know, but people who I'm curious about because I have relatives there, I think fear has more or less kept me outside of the South. I more or less have a like rule about not going south of the Mason-Dixon line. There's a way that there is a real pervasive racism north of the, race, of the Mason-Dixon line. I almost called it the racist line. Um, <laughs> the racist Dixon line. Yeah, the racist Dixon line. Um, there's a real, there is a real pervasive racism there that is often less spoken. The in-your-face, I'm going to call you a nigger, and I know that nobody is going to be able to challenge me. That's pretty terrifying to me. And I often think about what it would be like if I went back home and I, you know, did the things that I do now, which is to say, like, on a Friday night, like, drank too much, was out late because it's Palm Coast and there's no center, was, like, outside maybe having a smoke with a friend and a cop rolled up. It's like, I don't really know if I'm going to be the next headline on a newspaper. Right. And especially, you know, this week, the tragedy, which is an understatement, but the terrorist attack at the church in Charleston really reminds us that your fear is warranted. <laughs> it's a scary world, and there's a lot of terrible racist people out there. And on that note, um, I want to <laughs> see if there are questions from the crowd um, about city by city, about any of the readings from the authors, or just kind of more general about kind of this future of cities question. You know, hold on one moment, wait for the mic. How did you select your authors? Did you put out a call and did they come in or how did people get into the book? Yes, um, many different ways. Uh, one of the nice things about making something slowly, you know, cooking it for five years is that you do have a, a, lot, of, a lot of strange fish end up in the net, you know? Um, so uh, a, a lot of it was people we knew, you know? Um, uh, Elias and Dana, of course, are, are in some sense um, indigenous to N plus one. Uh, a lot of our other people were also folks who were around the office and were like, oh, where are you from? And like, oh, you know, place X. It's like, oh, you want to write about that? Yeah, maybe, you know, and so out of, and then two years later, you might have an essay. Um, some of this stuff came in uh, from, from the unsolicited submissions pile, um, and some of it sat for three years before someone read it and said, hey, maybe there's an essay here. Um, I remember with the, with the piece, I, I was really trying to find someone to write about Houston. So my friend uh, uh, Annie, who's from Texas, I was like, do you want to write about Houston? And she said, no. I don't, <laughs> but I want to write about Dallas. <laughs> so she wrote about Dallas. Um, and so it was really a, a lot of different ways. Uh, mostly people sort of self-selected uh, for it. There was a couple occasions where we were like, can you write about this? And we had to sort of convince a person to do that. But it was, it was mostly people sort of nominating themselves to write about stuff. Right, but also you should mention, it was a series that ran on the N plus one website, N plus one mag.com. And so people, yeah, check it out. Um, but so we published, the, we start, first started, public, you guys first started publishing the essays in 2010, 11. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that as soon as the series was up, writers would, you know, just send inquiries to the general inbox and say, I love your city by city series. Like, you know, I'm from, you know, Phoenix, like, I have an idea, and then they'd say, sure. Or sometimes people would send a submission to the magazine and be like, you know, this is a city-by-city city piece. So it was, it was mostly funneled through the mechanism of the, of the magazine. Yeah, but then at the end, we sort of took a look at the map and did our best to not leave two giant, like, two holes that were too large in, in terms of our coverage. So we had a, a sort of a broad, there are still some pretty large holes, but we did our best. Oh, one of the uh, topics they talked about online we might be talking about was the future of Philadelphia. Could anybody talk about what the future of Philadelphia is going to be? 
Elias, I think that's why we, why we oh, have God. you here, right? Um, I'm the only person who lives in Philadelphia on this panel, so I have to answer this. Well, um, <laughs> Ariel, do you have an answer? Yeah, yeah. No, you should give the answer. Oh, I yeah, Ariel. prefer I'll to hear you. your answer. All right, I'll, I'll take this one. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I think that the future of Philadelphia, we love to talk about it, right? I've only lived here three years, but I feel like I've had enough conversations for a lifetime. Um, and I think a lot of exciting things are happening in Philadelphia. Um, I think it's great even that all of you are here tonight. I think the level of civic engagement and sort of interest in the city's future is high. I think a lot of really important investment is happening. I also think that Philadelphia, like so many cities in the United States, is really sort of at a crossroads where we really have to deal with sort of questions of widening inequality and who we're building our neighborhoods for and figure out how to build neighborhoods that, that meet the needs of all of us, you know, the people who have been in Philadelphia for a long time, the people that are newer to the city, that, uh, like myself. Um, I think like industries, certainly the knowledge sector, you know, the tech industry, healthcare, all those things that have actually for a long time been important industries for Philadelphia will continue to grow. And I think that as we see, real estate values are, are on the rise here. So I think that there's reasons for optimism, but there's also reasons to think about how important political organizing is, how important it is to sort of rally with your neighbors and think about how you want your community to grow. So it's at a crossroads. Does, does that kind of answer your question? <laughs> is there something more specific? Like, but, but what is the future though? Like what's gonna happen? <laughs> Sorry, microphone. I lived in Philly about 20 years ago and um, decided to come back because I've been a wanderer. I grew up in Brooklyn, and Brooklyn is having an absolute resurrection of where it was and where it is now in a very positive way. And growing up in, uh, and coming to Philly, and I had lived in Los Angeles as well, and coming up to Philly again, coming back to Philly from um, New Orleans when the hurricane came, um, I've, I've discovered um, that it's better than ever. Uh, first of all, I have some old fr friends who, um, who have lived there for a long time, longer than I, and the better than, uh, better than ever for me was a choice that I had to make of where the devil do I want to live now? And Philadelphia was the first thing that came to my mind. And one of the things was, the bus is free for seniors, by the way, <laughs> uh, which, was, uh, <laughs> which was pretty important to me. And there's a, a sense of, of community here that I haven't seen for a long time. And this is part of it, just what you're doing today. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I see a question up here. Uh, this woman in black. So I was, um, wanted to ask a question about N plus one more broadly and what you all are doing as a publication. Um, I really enjoyed Francis Mullen's piece in New Left Review calling you all a party of latecomers. So I was wondering if you could speak to that term and what that means to you all. Uh, maybe it's sparked some controversy <laughs> internally, I don't know. And I was wondering if you could speak um, to N plus one and how it's uniquely positioned to create social criticism um, for a new kind of political action. Cool. Um, I don't think that N plus one is uniquely positioned to do those things. Um, what I think that N plus one has is, at this point, momentum and enthusiasm. Um, so a little background about the organization. N plus one was started as a literary magazine, a print magazine, 10 years ago by six writers and editors, young writers, who really wanted to revive the tradition of politically engaged literary magazines in New York and in the United States in the tradition of the Partisan Review and Lingua Franca. Um, and the magazine was started right around the time that several small magazines like The Baffler and Lingua Franca um, were folding because of the larger mag magazine industry um, going under. And so this was a, was a very exciting thing at the time. Um, I think that without being too presumptuous, I think the magazine was one of few places where you could engage literary criticism and a kind of vernacular academia um, and humor 
and social criticism all in the same place. And over the past 10 years, there's been an enormous flourishing, partly online, but also in print, of small journals and magazines like M plus One that now do very similar things. We joke sometimes about how they become more atomized, like the first issue of N plus One had a takedown of like <laughs> the New Republic and the Believer. the Believer and something else. And then tacked on to that takedown was a piece about um, basketball, about pro basketball. And so now like all, so N plus One also has like a deep history of like sports criticism. And we're like, okay, now that's Grantland. Grantland is that. Um, you know, you know, the new inquiry does that. Jacobin, a young left magazine, now does just the left thing. And so I think we're we're one of the few places that still I think does all of it. Um, but there's much there's much more now. Um, so we're in a weird position, despite the youth you see before you, um, being one of the older <laughs> magazines in this context. Um, as for the, and I guess in a way that could be. A, a, a way of being latecomers, being you know of a different generation, participating in this tradition and really trying to make it vibrant. Um, but now that you've given me an opportunity, I would also like to say that I was very mad about the NLR piece, despite its high praise, because every almost every woman who is working for the magazine, including myself, was only in a footnote even when our articles were discussed substantively. And I think that's more um, a product of the sexism of the NLR than it is of the, real, the reality of N plus one. Um, so, you know, the struggle continues. Um, but I think, but you know, that aside, there were some very wonderful things about that article in the NLR about N plus one. And the thing I liked the best was that it said a couple of things, that N plus one was not just a magazine or even a literary magazine so much as it was a magazine of criticism, which I think is true. Um, and also that it wasn't a magazine but a way of life. And I think that is also very true. Um, we're just an organization, a, you know, ever expanding organization of people that really likes to think together. Um, and I think it's special when you find that, but I don't think it's also especially unique. I think you can do it anywhere. You could do it in Philadelphia. And of course, the irony of a, a, a an Anglo left magazine called the New Left Review calling anyone a party of latecomers, uh, especially oh, yeah, when it was it. Uh, based on the reception of Althusser in the English language. Whatever, lots of latecomers <laughs> on the English <laughs> left. Okay, you're going to have that. to come up to us afterward if you want to understand what that meant. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to the next question here. Um, gentleman with the hat. It's really more a comment, Dana. Um, you said that at the uh, airport they sell, um, what were they, little... Souvenir keychains? Keychains with either the Hollywood sign or the palm trees. But I had heard, I don't know if this is true, but I think it's true, that palm trees are not even truly indigenous to Los Angeles. They're not. That's what I thought. They're and, not, yeah. um, and they're everywhere. Yeah. I think that um, this is like, you should, somebody in here can be like Googling this and telling me this is not true, but I, I remember someone telling me that I think Cher on her private property in Malibu had like four or five different species of palm tree imported for her like private compound. But yes, that's true. Yeah, when I was out there, I was told that, and I just want to quote something that a classmate of mine in New York <clears throat> in 1970 said about California because it will never leave me. Remember, this is before your time when things were kind of, uh, was about hippiedom in San Francisco. And I think, I'm not sure if the uh, Sharon Tate murders had already occurred, but you know what was going on in the country. Mm -hmm. She just sat there in a humanities class and she said, <laughs> Everything that's loose in the country rolls into California. So I thought true. it was so perfect. <laughs> that's so great. So we have that. time for one more question. Uh, I see that hand right in the fourth row. Yep. Um, speaking about uh, literary magazines uh, coming online, um, I was wondering if you think that that is more a blessing or a burden for young writers because on the one hand, there's more of an opportunity to have their voices heard, but on the other, there are so many voices that sort of gets lost in the shuffle. 
I, I mean, I, I don't know how to, I don't know, you know, how it comes out in the wash yet. Um, certainly both. Uh, Caleb Crane, who's a, a novelist and academic contributor at M Plus One, once said this wonderful thing um, in a book, of, a small book of advice that M Plus One put together for college students. Um, and he says, don't be precocious, keep a journal, but like, that's it. Um, and I loved that because uh, it's true, you, you shouldn't be precocious, she said. Um, but then on the other, you know, I think that it's good to publish um, and to get your work out there, um, partly because you read it in a different way as soon as you hit publish, even if it's just nobody's reading it and it's on your blog or whatever, um, it gives you a new way to look at it. And I think also the sooner you can be inured to, to senseless criticism, the better, because, you know, like it or not, we are in the era of unsolicited feedback. And people, especially if you're a woman, especially if you're a woman of color, people are gonna tell you that you're worthless and give you all sorts of reasons why you shouldn't exist. So the sooner you can, you know, hear that and get over it, the better. Um, but I also think one thing that's a shame about, um, the way that online publishing has thrown a wrench in print publishing is that so few people have editors. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I appreciate most about M plus one as somebody who's written there and worked there is that we take editing very, very seriously. Um, and you have a lot of readers who are trying to make your work as good as possible and trying, you know, really, they're not trying to torture you. They're really just trying to get you to, to, to pull it out of you. Um, and so when you're working alone and when you're self-publishing, or even if you just have some, you know, sympathetic readers, it's not the same as having an editor. Um, and even like having an editor, like for the online supplement of The New Yorker, it's not the same as like having an editor. Um, so I think that's one way in which print publishing, or digital publishing still has yet to catch up to print publishing. And it's an open question whether the, you know, economics of the new industry are gonna, you know, make editors a priority, and they really should, because that's what makes good writing. Um, but they're not, they're not there yet. I think we have yet to convince them that editors are important. They are, it'll show up. I think too, um, sorry. No, please. I think too, one of the things that people really seem to like about N plus one is the house style, to elaborate on that editor point, that, you know, when you have people who are paid to work really hard, or uh, in many cases not paid, but who work really hard <laughs> on making your work better and are really invested in sort of the book as an object, as a sort of print object, there's a sort of desire for consistency and the house style is actually a really nice thing. I remember there was, you know, some time when I was waiting for Keith to get back to my piece with me and I was like, oh, he hates the piece, it's never gonna, it's never gonna be published, I should just like put it on a blog or something. And if I had the piece would have been way worse, it would have been so much worse because Keith cut out a lot of the sort of melodrama, some of the excess and sort of really honed in this piece that was a lot better for having had the eyes of someone who is really dedicated to the style of a particular thing. And I think that part of that comes from having been invested in the magazine as a book, as a physical object, as wanting things within its pages in its inception to have some sort of consistency. There's loss of that sort of physical object and some of the uniquely helpful things that objects do if you publish on the net. And Stephen, maybe you can talk a little bit about the business model actually and how the books contribute to the website or if there's a relationship there because you guys can probably support M plus one and the editors by buying a book tonight. You uh, I would can. love to, but actually Dana probably knows the business model I do. better than I do. Okay. Well, um, so I mean, City by City is a really, is a great example of an M plus one project. It was something that Stephen wanted to do and proposed to Keith and they just sort of set out on it on their own. They were like, great, we'll, we'll make this, you know, we'll, we'll start soliciting these essays and if they turn out great, we'll make a book eventually. Um, and, you know, to kind of go back to your question about what sort of place M plus one is, um, you know, more than being a publisher even, we're just kind of like a group of people with a set of resources and those resources include an office with computers with publishing software on them and a website um, so it, it was just a platform that existed for you know if people were going to put in the work commission the essays edit them you know uh, curate them it could it could be there 
So um, we try to be flexible and allow those projects to exist because you know M plus one is a nonprofit. It it exists to publish this work, not to necessarily make money off of the work. And ideally, it flows back into the sort of central organism that can then produce more things. Um, but yeah, I think more than more than the business model, that's kind of just the um, the production model of the organization as a whole. It has this sort of like central core and is constantly like putting out its feelers to create new projects and accommodate them and give them a home. Great, thank you. Well, thank you all for being here tonight and I encourage you to check out nplus1.org and nextcity.org. Thank you so much. Thanks.